Hello, everyone, and welcome to another debrief episode of Channel 781 News. Um, this week, we're going to talk about the sidewalk resolution, which is resurfaced after months of not being talked about, um, the bike rack resolution. Um, sorry, I'm going to say that over, which is not, it's not even accurate. Um, the Bike and Pedestrian Ad Hoc Committee saga continues. Um, I'll be talking at length by myself about that. Um, and as well as uh, marijuana licenses coming up, it's actually good news uh, for once. Um, but first I wanna say that this is not a podcast. I, in town, people are like, oh, Chris, I like your podcast. This is not a podcast. I wanna be clear that when this started, I was like, I don't wanna make a podcast. Let's do it on, let's do it on Zoom and that it's not a podcast. People still say it's a podcast. I want to be clear, this is not a podcast. Um, and, <laughs> and, um, and as always, uh, joined by Josh Castor. Hello, everyone. James McKellys. Hello, everyone. And Emily Spirit. Hello, not a podcast. <laughs> not a many, pod- <laughs> many podcasts this record a, on Zoom, actually. This is a community conversation on YouTube. Okay, Chris, there might be a problem here because I actually had a job interview this week and they asked me if I ever did a podcast. What did you I say? Said, yes. Because I think you call it a podcast. This is a podcast. I though. think it's a podcast now. Oh, no. If you get any calls about my job application, just don't answer any questions. <laughs> Okay, okay. Um, moving on. Uh, but before we get into those three <laughs> things, um, Josh has a couple things uh, he would like to say. Yes, I first I wanted to point out thank you that this is a was a very big month. October was a very big month for Channel 781. We did four special reports. One was our first interview with an elected official, and we covered, we uh, recorded five of the master input meetings, plus our headline shows and our debrief shows. So it was a very productive month and exciting month for us. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. Thank you to all the people we interviewed. Thank you to Chris Hammer, who covered one of the meetings um, and whose notes on Reddit are very helpful for us. And uh, yeah, so uh, it's uh, very exciting times for Channel 781. I hope we can keep the momentum going. Also, we now have a Twitter, which we're going to be expanding. We'll look for us on Twitter. The other and thing- you, And if okay. you haven't watched the uh, Brenda interview, it is um, very good. You should watch it. Thank you. I agree. Yes, I think thank it's you, really Josh, important. Doing it. I think it's going to um, uh, have a big impact on how people talk about the schools going forward. I hope it does because it's gotten a lot of attention online. And thank you, Chris, for working with Brandon to set that up. That was really cool that we got to do that. The other thing I wanted to say is Open Studios is this weekend, uh, Waltham Open Studios, and I want to put a plug in for that because uh in my opinion if you're trying to have a more welcoming community a more diverse community more of a community community artists and art related businesses can help a lot with that um they can create experiences that are unique to your community um the steampunk festival would be a good example they bring diverse people into town they expose people to new ideas they can make public places more inviting and In the Boston area, one of the hardest resources for artists is space. It's very hard to find space to do your art or certain art-related business um, in the Boston area that's cost-effective. And Waltham actually, I think, has more rentable artist spaces than I think any other town in the area except for Boston, maybe Somerville. And so that's a huge asset we have as a community, but people don't think of Waltham is an artsy town necessarily, Um, but that's why I think people should go to open studios. If you've never been, basically, they give you a map of all the studios, which are mostly in walking distance from each other, and you just wander into the ones you want to wander into, um, look at the art, you usually get to see how they make the art, you can talk to the artists if you want to, you don't have to, they won't be offended if you don't talk to them, because they always like a break. Uh, most of the artists have things for sale, so it's a chance to get something much more unique than you can get at Ikea or something. Um, but even if there's no chance you're going to buy anything, you should still go because it's not just about selling things for the artists. It's about introducing themselves to the community. And um, they will always appreciate having people there. They know that not many people are going to end up buying something. 
Um, so the other thing is I believe they are still looking for volunteers and possibly even some paid positions to help out this weekend. Um, I saw a post about that last week. Um, so if you're interested, I get in touch with them. If you, if you want to volunteer this weekend, that could be a really good way to meet creative, interesting people in town. So that's, that's all for that. I just like to put out a plug for open studios. Very good. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. We had fun last year. We did. Um, so moving on to council stuff. Um, in this week's, uh, last week's city council meeting, um, the sidewalk resolution, um, the shoveling of sidewalk resolutions, uh, essentially the removal of snow uh, resolution was brought up. Now this is something that we at 781 News followed very closely when it was introduced, um, which was, I think Josh would remind me uh, exactly when, but, um, and then it kind of just like stopped being talked about. Um, and we, you know, we talked about it, you know, a couple months after reading, like, I wonder where this is, wonder where this resolution is, it's important. Nothing was talked about on the open floor for a while. And now uh, just this past meeting, it was talked about. And Josh, if you could explain how that occurred, uh, what, what was talked about. Yeah, so I watched that part of the rules and ordinances meeting and uh, it does seem like they've talked about this before with it recently because they have a draft. Um, that the legal um, office has been working on. So they may have talked about it in one of the many meetings that we missed because those ones are not usually recorded and they're usually later at night. This was a special meeting before the council. Um, and when I went online, I was not able to find the text of the ordinance. The most recent minutes I could find that mentioned this were from December of last year, but I don't think that's the last time they discussed it. I think it's been brought up since then. So basically they, at this meeting, they just asked the legal office to make a few edits to the draft, and then they are going to make the draft public and uh, seek public input on it. So people should keep an eye out for some sort of announcement from the city seeking public input on this. From what I understood in the meeting, um, the way it works is everybody will be required to uh, remove snow from in front of their from the sidewalks in front of their property. You're not allowed to put snow on city property, which includes the sidewalk and the street. And there will be different categories of building and depending which category you're in, there's a certain time limit that it's done and there's a certain fine. Um, and there was a person um, in City Hall who has the power to enforce that and um, has the power to give extensions if needed on those time limits. I'm not sure who that was though. I didn't catch what that position was. Um, the one thing that was very concerning about it is if, if I understood correctly from the conversation, there's an exemption for single family and two family homes, which really does not make sense at all to me. Um, and I hope I'm wrong about that, but I wasn't the only one who interpreted it that way. Our friend Amon uh, did a tweet about this where he pointed out just how much, and we can show you his graphic points out just how much of Waltham is single and two family homes. So this isn't really, um, so it doesn't make sense to me because Councillor Harris emphasized that this was about safety and it had to be done soon. She said that in the context of um, in the current draft, there was sort of an expiration clause, like if the, the council has to reaffirm this to keep going like it was a pilot and she wanted to take that out. She wanted to just have it be permanent once it goes into place, not a pilot. Um, but she emphasized that this is about safety. So if it's a safety rule, it applies to everyone. Right? Like if you go on a construction site, it's not like you have to wear a hard hat unless you're the foreman. Like everybody, it's if it's safety, it's not about who you are, it's everyone. And if somebody who's walking by an apartment building has a right to not fall on ice and break their back, then why does someone who's walking front of a single family home not have that right? Um, I think that would also make it practically impossible to enforce because people are going to be confused. They're going to look out and see that there are many of the sidewalks are not cleared. Some of them it's because they're exempt. Some of them it's because somebody's just not doing it. But people are not going to take it seriously as a responsibility that you need to keep your neighbors safe if 
half the city is exempt from it. That makes it seems like it's not really about safety. Um, so uh, keep an eye out for that draft because hopefully um, if I'm right that that is what they're doing, I think we should um, get them some feedback about that. I think it's worth pointing out that Kathy Ann Harris would be exempt from shoveling her sidewalk under this plan. Yes, all the counselors except Paz would be exempt, right? Indeed. Well, Paz is landlord, I should say. But that's a whole other part of this is it's going to take a long time for landlords to discover that this is even a law and take it seriously. And if it's not a law for some people, that's just going to make that process harder. Also, very course, often they tend to tell the tenants that it's their job to shovel the sidewalks. Yeah, exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. And it just makes it harder for tenants to push back on that if half the town isn't shoveled or it's because they don't have to, you know. Even on the south side, too, there's a lot. This exempts a lot of the things. I mean, you're going to have you have the graphic that you should, but it's it's the the this was introduced, I believe, shortly after the blizzard uh, earlier in the year, or at least the, the one that was introduced this year. I saw it on the docket after that, and I recall it was because there was a lot of people talking about the uh, how much snow is piled up on the street and like kids just being able to get to the bus because it, it, it had a line that there was a massive snowfall I think right during like I think the I think the boiler in the school had also died at that time too so there's like a lot of just general maintenance issues coming to a head during that one incident but the 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 the, the patchwork of um sidewalks getting shoveled isn't going to actually address the problem of like kids getting to school safely in a situation like that not in a city where what is it something like 50 percent of homes are rented yeah it's somewhere around 50 50. i did remembered one comment she made about that is she said that they had consulted with cpw and cpw told them it was really the re the commercial areas and the dense residential areas where they needed help so that's her so to her it's not arbitrary this was the recommendation of the cpw but i that is that doesn't seem right to me because the point of the ordinance is to keep people safe the point of the ordinance isn't to help out cpw a little bit or help them out a lot it's to keep it's to do what's needed for people to be safe so i think that's even though they took that step of talking to cpw that's great it's still a very arbitrary Rule. What's going on said there though is that they've already said the like the giving CPW a certain amount of money to work with for the year, and they're they're basically saying that they aren't going to be able to pay them enough to do the actual amount of work that needs to get done to ensure this is a thing. This is this is the problem. And Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in that um, committee they was talking about how because this is a zone change that it has to go to a public hearing, and so we can expect that. Yes, that is what they said there. Yeah. It does need to be um, discussed publicly. So yeah, and advertised. We'll um, see if it's if it's if it's the kind of public where they actually want you to come, or the kind of public where they do the bare minimum. But yeah. I think it would be a good idea for maybe people to ask questions about this part. Yeah, and I mean, the, talk about politics. It's you know, people go and say they don't support this because it's not powerful enough. Do you become the ableist and obstructionist for not supporting the clearing of sidewalks um, just because we think it doesn't go far enough. And I'm sure that's what the top of the point will be used on the council. You know, no, this needs to pass because this is progress. Uh, but is, is it really progress if essentially nothing is being done? The status quo is maintained, but there's been a resolution. Yeah, they can point at something and say, we care about this issue. We did this, uh, but essentially nothing is being done. If part of it is to make the city more accessible for people with disabilities, it's pretty much useless. They can't like decide what streets they're going to walk down based on which ones. And they, if they, they want to go where they have to go, and if, and if they wanted to be like comprehensive about it, right? Like you could look at like the the commuter rail like access or like access to like the transit networks as like priority areas to be cleared, and then like vote work outward from there, maybe. But like just doing it by zoning feels like a very odd abstraction that isn't necessary. It seems like it undermines the, the, the point you need people to, for it to work, people have to appreciate that this is a responsibility. It's not just something where, and, and, and you can't make people feel like if it's, it's a responsibility, if it's arbitrary, whose responsibility it is. So we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, make sure people know about the public hearing. Hopefully it can, 
serve as a way for counselors to realize that this is going in the wrong direction, but who knows? Um, let's do um, marijuana licenses next and save my long rant for the end. Um, so uh, resident and marijuana license expert, Emily Superior uh, can tell us more about um, what transpired. So um, we've been watching these rules and ordinances meetings for uh, it feels like and it has been years now. Um, and finally, at this special rules and ordinance, ordinances meeting last week, um, they ran the meeting backwards. So we didn't actually start talking about cannabis retail shops until about halfway through um, bumping up against the regular city council meeting. Um, but the long and short of it is that. Uh, Thrive Cultivation, um, which is a business run by the Cardillo, Cardillo family, has been approved in rules and ordinances for a special permit for a cannabis retail shop on Bear Hill Road. Um, so they will be moving on to city council for the full approval. Um, and then the next step is that the mayor um, uh, will need to execute a host community agreement with that business. Um, so it is to be seen how long that process will take. And I think um, just as going through the special permitting process with rules and ordinances, I think kind of laid a groundwork of the process itself, I think, um, well, this, this may not be the first host community agreement. Supposedly there was one for Middlesex Integrated Management, but I, I think um, we are laying the ground work for mapping out how this process will go. Um, and so that is uh, a landmark that we are moving towards our first retail cannabis dispensary in town in Waltham here. What would the address uh, be for that one? Uh, 235 Bear Hill Road. I was about to say that. Thank you. Um, uh, so this is one of the many applicants that are on Bear Hill Road, um, right off of the 128 exit. Um, and yeah, I mean, after all those conversations, after all that community was going, not the end, because I think the council still has to vote on it on an open floor. So the, the council part is done. They need a community host agreement. Uh, yeah. and the, Emily, you could talk a little bit more about that, but that's essentially the mayor giving her vote of approval, the community host agreement. Yeah, so so and it, I think they still need, my understanding is they still need to go be referred to the full city council mm -hmm. for the full city council vote, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but so they still need to negotiate a host mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. agreement with the mayor um, which has to do with um, the rate at which they will pay into um, a, the local community impact fee, which recently has been capped by the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, and I don't know exactly what other terms can be put into that, but essentially it is a contract directly with um the municipal executor which in our case is our mayor has been designated the executor on the host community agreements um and so i think I, I think it's just to be seen how long this process takes or i guess one one thing i'm wondering is what information we're able to have access to or not about the host community agreement drafting process because where we were at least to able to go to the rules and ordinances meetings um, and see, you know, or if one of our colleagues was recording a meeting, at least see what was going on there, see what the questions were. And even though it was very frustrating, we could at least um, somewhat get a handle on the process. The host community agreement, um, will be negotiated behind closed doors. So while I don't have concerns about terms or anything like that, because Cannabis Control Commission, I think has tightened up the screws on what can and cannot be done. Um, the timeline 
is unclear to me. Emily, you had said that you thought M um, UMA may also get approved um, by that committee within the next few weeks. Can you say more about that? I think it's likely, um, and that is a guess based on um, the interactions in that last meeting. Um, the there was a number of conditions on the building permit. Um, and, and they kept talking about the building permit in addition to the special permit in rules and ordinances in regards to UMA flowers. Um, they talked about um, an access easement that runs over these parking spaces at UMA flowers. They talked about um, not exercising those access rights. The question really became, can could there just be these you know could we have these conditions on the special permit basically if we meet these conditions can we go forward um and you know kathy ann harris made this comment which was we can't give discretion we've got to follow our ordinances it's really about following the rules this is a big thing to work out, make sure you're all comfortable. And if you need something else, it's gonna come back here. And if not, it's totally kosher and there's no issue. Um, and the attorney said, I don't think there's any point in belaboring it anymore right now. So, and Harris said, right, right. You guys noodle on it and come back in two weeks next. So that's what happened. Um, basically they are so close, um, but ultimately, one of the members of rules and ordinances committee said you're you're so close but i'd really like to see she goes back to you know t's crossed and eyes dotted and i think that the attorney just felt that it wasn't worth pushing back so they will be coming back november 7th i think um and and that's what makes me think that they are very close in to get but very close to getting approved for this special permit was just that that exchange correct me if i'm wrong but i think that sticking point was also like they had like a they hadn't made any physical changes to the property that they're going to be operating out of and it was like a it had already been like the thing that they were complaining about had already been that way i guess for it was my understanding and that they just had to sort out how it had ended up that way yeah there was an issue with a loading dock a smaller loading dock that was internal as opposed to an external loading dock. And it, it appears that this, I think, will not be an issue. But, and I think it, it looks like it is documented, if I recall correctly. Um, but the Rules and Ordinances Committee was not satisfied. And um, I think the attorney on behalf of his clients feels that after all the time and all the work they've done, it was best to satisfy the committee. Well, due to the uh, rigorous and very thorough uh, zoning plan for marijuana licenses, uh, I'll uh, share my screen, the two um, likely applicants that are gonna see uh, their applications go through are a three minute walk away from each other. So thankfully we'll have two places to buy re uh, recreational marijuana in a three minute walk from each other. So I'm excited about that. Thank you zoning, uh, Waltham zoning for that. But it is wild, Chris, remember, I remember sitting down with you at Cafe on the Common and looking at that mm -hmm. Google map and like, like drawing five years up. ago. Yeah, five years ago. like you know, where could these businesses possibly go? And we looked at that big blob on Bear Hill Road and there they are. Yeah. That and, and like a little like, bit on Fountain Street. That's all I really remember yep. that conversation. And, and so it's also, and, and that's come up in these um, master plan meetings too. In the first one, yeah. uh, the uh, specifically pointing out yeah. someone, someone who had bought property and was trying to open a business on in the industrial area that was within range of some of the things I have to think of some of the fields in the area may preclude it from being a, a dispensary for our zoning but like but this has also been brought up in the master plan meetings yeah. yeah that was my first introduction into I think zoning at all but really 
learning anything about it, but then realizing how much of an impact it can have on a municipality and how it runs, where things can be, um, all sorts of, um, a network of implications. Yeah, the many, many hoops that people have to go through. Well, thank you for that. Um, we'll keep up to date on that. Um, and yeah, like Emily said, the timeline is still incredibly unclear because they still do the community host agreement and I'm sure there's more check marks to be done as well. Um, but we will keep talking about it. Um, last thing we wanna talk about from the uh, city council meeting was the bike and pedestrian committee, um, which we've been keeping a close eye on. If you haven't heard if you haven't listened to our discussions around that past couple of debriefs, this next bit might be a little confusing. Um, but uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk pretty high level about what happened and then talk about what um, my feelings towards what was said and the discrepancies and inconsistencies and fallacies that I think um, were brought up. Um, uh, on the council floor, there's a vote from the Committee of the Whole mm -hmm. to move the Bike and Pedestrian Committee to the Master Plan Committee. Um, and we just brought this up actually, but every uh, vote that, the com that any committee takes is then voted on by the full city council. Every single uh, vote that, they, that any committee does, um, the full council also has a say on. Um, and so that's what they're being talked about right now. The, all the full council is voting on the committee of the whole recommendation. Um, so we thought that was gonna happen, but George uh, rises to withdraw the motion without prejudice. It's his resolution. Um, he has a right to withdraw the motion without prejudice. So what does that mean? Um, so when you submit a resolution, you uh, it could be from a counselor, it could be a special permit hearing, it could be a, you know, a contractor developer, it could be anybody. When you submit a resolution, you, your intention is, is it for it to pass. Everyone thinks that it's gonna pass. You think you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's. Sometimes that that is not true. Sometimes you know you were wrong about zoning. Sometimes you were um, wrong about, you know there was a typo in your thing. Um, and sometimes people, withdraw without prejudice, which is essentially just taking something off the docket without voting no, and worse, uh, filing. Filing is probably the worst thing that can happen um, to any docket item, um, uh, which it means that it is a voted no, and you um, can't discuss it, uh, you can't introduce it, and nothing very similar um, can be introduced for an entire year uh, at the Waltham City Council. Um, that's So uh, that's what filing is. And so you do not want anything to get filed. You pretty much don't want anything to be voted no either. So if something, if you if you see the writing on the walls uh, that your resolution is not gonna pass, you sometimes withdraw without prejudice or just sits in the council floor forever and dies a slow death. Um, and so George uh, gives a speech about how he would like to withdraw without prejudice because he realizes that this is not as popular as he thought it was going to be and he would really like to talk with more counselors more one-on-one -on -one to get them behind the idea of non-elected residents being on the committee because he feels like that's the sticking point that the council doesn't like uh which uh, you know is neither here nor there because it actually wasn't brought up at all in the last committee it does get up uh this committee which i will talk a little bit about uh soon uh but he's essentially like i'm going to withdraw this as my resolution i'm going to do this um and we'll you know well i'll, I'll do the more outreach than i uh, thought i needed to do before and we'll try again. um plenty of resolutions have gone that way um so while it's interesting that I thought it was that it was being done in the council and not the committee, I thought it would pass. Uh, but even that, um, even pulling the resolution out is not enough for, for this council. Um, Kathy Ann Harris, the person that was the vocal opponent of the idea at the last meeting, um, strongly proclaimed that she's against the withdrawal because she wants to see the resolution sit in the master plan committee because she wants to talk about it and thinks that that's the um, spot to do it in. Um, even mentioning that she doesn't support the idea of residents being on the committee, she would rather be on the master plan committee. Ultimately, the withdrawal failed. 
um, and Colleen, uh, Jonathan Paz, and Karen Dunn, um, which was a surprising random vote for me, um, all supported George, but a resounding no from the rest of the city council. So the resolution is now in the master plan committee. Um, so I have uh, several uh, opinions about why this is shady. The first being, it's George's resolution. It's his, he can, he can decide to withdraw it if he wants. Uh, the council usually respects the wish of the resolution creator, um, as well as they usually defer to the ward counselor in interests and developments that are talked about on the open floor inside of a counselor's ward. Um, they usually just defer to whatever they wanna do. Um, this is a clear example of, the, of a caveat um, that's always missing when that's when that when that phrase is said, you know, they, they defer to the ward counselor. Um, the full statement is the council to defers to the ward counselor when the council feels like it. Uh, because it's not always true. It's the council doesn't particularly like something that's going on. They can just do whatever they want. Um, if 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 something is going on in the ward of a counselor and the rest of the council doesn't particularly like what the ward counselor is doing, it's not unheard of for them to uh, submit resolutions from resident uh, from wards that they don't live in. It's not unheard of to adulterate another counselor's resolution that has to do with their ward if they don't really like it. And so the next time a counselor is particularly upset about a resolution that's theirs or a, a ward specific issue that's theirs, just remember that you know they defer to the council to the counselor to the ward counselor when the council feels like it. That is the full statement there. Um, so George's wish on his own committee is disregarded and it's um, now sitting in the masculine committee. Um, so here's, here's a couple of quotes. Um, Kathy Ann Harris, this is a resolution that needs to move forward. And so they're putting it in the master plan committee. Um, here's what boggles my mind about this whole conversation. The master plan committee has never met, not once. You might be thinking, oh, this, this is a hyperbole. The master plan committee was created 11 months ago and it has never met one time, not a single time on the count on the full city council floor, like every other committee meets, not one single time has that committee met. They have been doing the ward specific meetings um, and those have been great. And you know, we've talked a lot about them, I enjoy them. Um, but to actually talk about issues or actually talk about the master plan in an open public transparent floor, the master plan committee has never once met. So that is the committee that Kathy Ann Harris thinks that real progress is going to be done. Given a toss up between a, res a committee, an ad hoc committee that is specifically about bicycle and pedestrian uh, advocacy and safety and a committee that has literally never met is non-binding and has a million other things to talk about. Given those two things, um, given those two committees, Kathy Ann Harris thinks the one that has never met is non-binding and has a million other things. Well, she thinks that's the one that real progress is going to be made in bike and pedestrian advocacy. Um, quote from Kathy Ann Harris, uh, I sense a political agenda here if there is such a thing around bicycles, which is tragic to me. Yeah, there is politics around bicycles. You just you don't see that because you're usually on the side of cars every time. Every time there's a special permit hearing for a development uh, with minimum parking requirements that's not abolished, that is Paul. That is that is the political agenda of bicycles on the car side. Every time there's a license renewal for an auto body shop that isn't struck down, that is the political agenda of bicycles on the car side. Every time municipal land is torn down so a parking lot can be built. That is the political agenda of bicycles on the car side. It happens every single city council meeting, just the bicycles never win in, in the political agenda. Um, quote, this, this is great. I know that there are opinions that, that people in the public should serve on these boards, but elected officials are accountable to voters. And so the public shouldn't be in this committee. Um, this is really just like a mask off moment for me in terms of being clear that this is just about power. Um, the traffic commission has way more power when it comes to city streets than a bicycle and ad hoc, a pedestrian ad hoc committee does. But Kathy Ann sees no problem with them being unelected um, by the public. The conservation commission, uh, the community preservation uh, committee, those are all 
unelected residents of Waltham, but we see no objection to, to that. Uh, but the idea that residents would be on this committee somehow disturbs Kathy and Harris. Um, quote, if there are people in this community that want bike advocacy, then I want to know about it. Kathy and Harris, the Warrior City Council said, this is just bad governing. Um, that's just a bad opinion. That's just saying, I have never heard this was an issue, so it isn't one, which is reminiscent of Sean Durkee saying that the Stop Asian Hate Resolution um, last year was not needed because he had never seen any Asian hate crimes in Waltham, which just blew me away at the time. Um, but Kathy Ann cared as much about this issue as she proclaims to care about it on the open floor, then she would have been in these communities talking about bike advocacy she would have been part of these things, these conversations for decades. These have been things. These things have always been talked about. It's just you know, the people that care about these things, they're the ones talking about. It. Um, so to say that the that the desire isn't there because she isn't part of the conversation is 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 naive. It's it's naive to think that the, the desire is not there. Uh, to say that the entire city a bike and pedestrian advocates has to reach out to the Ward 8 city councilor, a vast majority of which, you know, didn't vote for her and are not accountable, uh, to even get their opinions heard is, is, is self-centered. Uh, if she cares so much about the issue, if she cares so much about the issue, then let George take his resolution back and then just talk about it in the master plan committee, which has never met. Talk about it. Go ahead and talk about it. Why do you need to have George's resolution sit in limbo forever uh, in a committee that never meets uh, to, to, to talk about bike and pedestrian advocacy, which is something that apparently this council cares a lot about. Just talk about it. Why do you need to essentially to just kill George's resolution by atrophy to even talk about these things? This is also this has also been getting slow walk too because when it was first introduced it was kicked down another two weeks basically uh, yeah because, I mean every step uh, of the way because it, because it was honestly it was his own mistake because it was introduced late but at the same time like yeah I mean it, 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 late it, file it, communications happen all the time but apparently it, when George does it like it is it is terrible yeah no this has been it, it, it's been slow road the entire time um, and we're, we're talking about uh, in the past George's uh, bike rack resolution. Um, uh, uh, separated bike lane resolution on Lexington, that was not comprehensive enough for Kathy Ann. We haven't even talked about the fact that Kathy Ann Harris at this last city council meeting introduced a, a resolution to look at bike racks on the south side. That is absolutely shocking to me is that the Kathy Ann Harris uh, would make a standalone issue on bike advocacy while at the same time publicly shaming another city councilor for doing the exact same thing while also not being in favor of creating a bike and pedestrian ad hoc committee. George's separated bike lane resolution was not comprehensive enough for her, but she can introduce a standalone bike rack on the south side resolution. That's comprehensive enough. But George's resolution not comprehensive enough. It's it is shocking to me that she felt that that was not a low blow to introduce it after what she did to George. And I usually have no no issue with Kathy at all. She's a great person for projects, but I am shocked at how much she wants to make this issue, which is an issue that she has never championed. Uh, how that she wants to make this about her for whatever reason, not the good of the city. It, it disturbs me. Um, and let's not forget that the municipal elections are coming up and George is going to be very vulnerable because of the things we've talked about uh, in the past couple of weeks. It isn't lost on me that the people that wouldn't want George to win would, are doing themselves a favor by having his work go nowhere uh, until the election. Um, and so that's pretty much uh, all I want to say on the matter. Um, I just I'm glad I have this platform to just really call out this kind of behavior because you know the council like voted uh, with it. There's very little dissent, but I just wanted to be to say like this is shady. Like this is weird. This is like not really where how this should go. So I'm glad to have this platform. A little dramatic to to watch that unfold. I mean, I, I, 
not entirely unexpected considering how things have been going, but like it, it definitely highlighted the for me the way that things kind of get like the, the, the rules are sort of set up to be selectively enforced, you know, so like the, like the bringing things in like late file is okay until it isn't. At master plan committee gets presented as like the only way stuff actually gets done, despite the fact that resolutions get brought get brought in all the time or and like or like that the master plan committee is somehow more like valid than like an ad hoc committee, despite the fact that master plan committee is also an ad hoc committee. It just it feels, yeah, like, which it feels like the mind. rules are made up on the fly, you know? Yeah. And uh, I mean, Paul Cates uh, last week said that he doesn't agree that this should uh, be an ad hoc committee because it, you know, it, it, semantics, which I love, like ad hoc committees have an end, and this is an issue that you know should just be forever. And it's just like, then then make it a real. Committee. Why don't you, if you think that way, you make a resolution that makes it a binding forever forever committee. Just do that instead of just essentially killing this resolution, which is exactly what's happening. Well, and it, it's, it's like a rhetorical play, like from the sidelines acting as if you're in favor of something of and you want, it to be maxim, you want to be maximalist about it. Therefore, the only reasonable thing to do is to shoot this down. Yeah, no, uh, no, George is being obstructionist. He, the, the council wants to talk about bike and pedestrian advocacy and bring it to the master plan where they will, it will reflect. Um, and there is a counselor that is holding it up and it is George Darcy. And so that's that's the story that they can tell. And they even have they even have empirical proof. They can point at it. They can say, mm -hmm. we did this. But the truth is that George is attempting to build a committee that would reimagine how Waltham looks at roads and and pedestrians. And the city, the council doesn't really like it. It would be good at least to whatever the outcome if they do bring in people from committees or like examples of committees from other neighboring areas that have much better bike infrastructure and existing committees yeah i mean that is still that is a motion that passed last week we talked about it george before it went to the committee made a motion to to invite from neighboring cities, uh, representatives of their bike and pedestrian committees, because again, this is not a radical idea. Plenty of other cities have this. And so that can that that motion did pass. And so the city clerk, I think, is obligated to do that, unless George decides because he's the maker of the resolution, I guess you could decide not to do it. Or maybe the city clerk will realize there's a you know a technicality that he's not supposed to do that. But besides that, he's obligated to do that. He's obligated to invite those people. So whenever this master plan committee meets for the first time maybe we'll hear from someone it's a good example of something we talked about we've talked about before how it's it's hard for new people to get involved in city government and understand how it works because of this habit of when you don't like an idea you don't just vote it down you try to put it somewhere where it'll languish forever and so for the next year, maybe two years, if somebody asks the counselors whatever happened with that, then they can say, oh, that's still in progress. We're still working on that. But I just think it's really disingenuous. And I just, it, I wish that counselors, if they don't like an idea, would just say they don't like the idea because it's incredibly confusing for people to follow an issue to say, I care about bikes, I care about housing, so I'm going to follow what happens with this. It's really hard to do. And it's, it's, I, I was just really disappointed in Councilor Harris because I thought her explanation for exempting um, the single family homes from the snow shoveling was very disingenuous too. Mm -hmm. And also when Councilor McMenamin was explaining to Councilor Darcy about what was going to happen with this, it was in that kind of tone, like you're frustrating me because you're not following the process in this very self-righteous kind of tone. And it's like, but that's not really the point. The point is, do we want a bike lane or not? The point is, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it, I, they spend a lot of time sort of um, getting annoyed at people who are messing up the process, but it's not really about the process. It's about, do you support this or do you not? And often the process is just a way to put off saying whether they support something or not. Um, so yeah, I think it was disappointing what happened with this. So I think that brings us to the end of our debrief. Um, I thought this was a good, uh, discussion. Um, so we will be back next week, uh, to talk about, um, the, 
city council committee meetings. Um, this will be another opportunity for the bike lane uh, resolution to be brought up for the first time. It actually is not yet even being talked about in uh, the public works and public safety committee. First time for the master plan committee to talk about uh, this committee. Um, and also continuing discussions on marijuana. Um, I think uh, the kids are about to come to our door. It is Halloween as we're recording this. So happy Halloween, everyone. And we will see you uh, next week. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.